Act Three of the School Mistress by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Third Act The Nightmare. The scene is a well furnished, tastefully decorated morning room in the house of Admiral Rankling. At the further end of the room there are two double doors facing each other, one with glazed panels opening to a conservatory, the other to a dark room. There are also two doors near to the pillars that support an archway spanning the room. All is in darkness, save for a faint glow from the fire, and a blue light coming through the conservatory windows. Peggy, dressed as before, enters quietly, looking about her. Where have I got to now, I wonder? what a dreadful wilderness of a house to wander about in in the dark all alone oh for the daylight looking at her watch half past six why gracious here's a spark of fire oh joy she goes down on her knees and replenishes the fire with coal from the scuttle the door opens and gwendolen peeps in what room is this? Entering noiselessly. Will the day never break? Frightened and retreating as Peggy makes a noise blowing up the fire. Oh! Oh, who is that? Looking around. Gwendolen? Peggy! Are you wandering about too? Yes, I can't sleep. Can you? Peggy, shivering. Sleep? No. As if I could sleep in a strange bed in a strange house, in one of Admiral Rankling's nightgowns. You didn't meet any daylight on the stairs, did you? Another door opens, and Ermatrude enters noiselessly. Gwendolen, clinging to Peggy. Oh, look there! Ermatrude, in a whisper. I wonder where I am now. Ermatrude. Ermatrude, clinging to a chair. Ah! Be quiet. It's we. It's us. It's her and me. Oh, my grammar's going now. Can't you girls get to sleep? I should think not. There wasn't any daylight in your room when you came down, was there? I thought I saw a glimmer through the window on the first floor landing. Ah, perhaps that's some of yesterday's. I know. I've made up the fire. Let us bivouac here till daybreak, two by the fire, and take it in turns for the sofa picking up a bearskin rug and carrying it to the sofa. Who's first for the sofa? Oh, Ermintrude. Gwendolen. Come along, Gwendolen. Gwendolen puts herself upon the sofa, and Peggy covers her with a bearskin. There, as soon as you drop off to sleep, it will be Ermintrude's turn. Looking through the conservatory doors. Oh, how the snow is coming down. Joining Ermintrude, who is warming her hands by the fire. She sits in an armchair. Peggy, do you know what has become of poor Dinah? Yes, she's locked up, upstairs, till the morning. Admiral Rankling locked her up. Gwendolen, from the sofa. It's a shame. Go to sleep. Oh, what a scene there was. Admiral Rankling foamed at the mouth. It was lucky they got Mr. Quackett away from him in time. Where is Mr. Quackett? Go to sleep. Ermatrude, leaning against Peggy's knees. Mr. Quackett is locked up too, isn't he? Of course he is. Till the morning. Miss Diet locked him up. Very properly, I think. And where's Miss Diet? Upstairs, in the room next to mine. In hysterics. Hush. I do believe Gwendolen has gone off. Are you pretty comfortable? Ermatrude her head on Peggy's lap. Yes, thank you. <sighs> the door quietly opens, and Saunders appears. Peggy and Ermatrude are hidden from him by the armchair. I can't sleep in my room. Where have they put Uncle Jack, I wonder? Seeing Gwendolen, who was sleeping with the light from the conservatory windows upon her. Oh, what's that? Going softly up to Gwendolen and looking at her. Why, here's my Gwen. I wonder if she'd mind my sitting near her. Turning up his coat collar and sitting gently on the footstool, 
he leans against the head of the sofa drowsily now if any robbers wanted to hurt gwen i could kill them closing his eyes wearily oh. soon there is a sound of heavy regular breathing from the four sleeping figures the door opens and mallory enters mallory shivering Ugh. can't get a blessed wink of sleep where have i wandered to why this is the room where the awful row was seeing gwendolen hello here's one of those schoolgirls discovering saunders and well this nephew of mine is a devil of a fellow that isn't a glimmer of a fire surely walking toward the fireplace he nearly stumbles over ermatrude more girls he accidentally knocks over the scuttle they all wake with a start what's, what's that? that who, who is, is it? it hush don't be frightened it's only i mr mallory i've been wandering about can't sleep no we can't sleep either well i don't know about that ermatrude lights the candle on mantelpiece why haven't you and mr saunders gone home you're not burnt out perhaps not but admiral ranklin asked me to remain and if he hadn't i'm not going to leave this house till my friend quecket is out of danger out of danger yes are you aware that you young ladies have brought very grave difficulties upon that unfortunate gentleman peggy crying he encouraged us he's a man now pray don't cry my dear miss what is your name this morning hesleridge and i wish i'd never been born hesleridge and you wish you'd never been born taking her hand well miss hesleridge the serious aspect of the affair is that admiral rankling has a most violent ungovernable temper peggy tearfully i know i've never seen a gentleman foam at the mouth before it's quite a new experience of course of course and therefore i'm apprehensive for poor mr quecket's bodily safety meanwhile i won't disturb you any longer come along saunders where are you going to the front door to speak a word or two of encouragement to that young fellow Paulover. oh is he outside still in the snow why he's been walking up and down on the other side of the way all night and you haven't let him in how could i you forget that our host has forbidden him the house no i don't i saw them roll out on the road together girls shall we open the front door or shall we remain the mere slaves of etiquette well i should like to let him in certainly why not come along i know the way saunders gwendolen and ermatrude go out quietly mallory to peggy well you'll perhaps pardon my saying that you are a devil-may-care little schoolgirl you make a great mistake i am not a schoolgirl i am struggling to be a governess ah uh, i hope you'll make your way in your profession peggy has discovered the spirit stand on the sideboard and now places it on the table what are you going to do now brew poor mr Pollover something hot bringing the kettle and spirit lamp to the table light this lamp for me please he lights the lamp if you can recommend me at any time to a lady with young daughters i shall be grateful i will i will i think i am almost capable of finishing any young lady now i am sure you are looking at the spirit lamp is that a light they put their heads down close together to look at the lighted lamp that's all right seems so they rise and look at each other we'd better watch it perhaps 
in case it goes out. They bob down again with their heads together and both sit on the same chair. You'll get into an awful scrape over your share in last night's business, won't you? Frightful. The thought depresses me. Do you think Miss Diote, or Mrs. Quackett, or whatever she is, will send you home? She can't. She's got me forever. She took me years ago for a bad debt. How can she punish you, then? I think she will withdraw her confidence from me. You won't despair, will you? I'll try not to. What a jolly little sailor's wife you'd make, brewing grog like this. I hope I should do my duty in any station of life to which I might be called. I'm a sailor, you know. No, are you? Mallory, taking her hand and putting it to his lips. You know I am. Peggy, suddenly. It's going to boil over. They jump up quickly. Mallory retreats. Oh, no, it isn't. Gwendolen and Ermatrude enter, leading Reginald, with Saunders following. Reginald is in a deplorable condition, covered with snow and icicles. His face is white and his nose red. Oh, poor Mr. Pullover. He's frostbitten. Thaw him by degrees. Peggy mixes the grog. Gwendolen and Ermatrude lead Reginald to a chair before the fire, he uttering some violent but incoherent exclamations. He's annoyed with Admiral Rankling. The girls chafe his hands while he still mutters, with his eyes rolling. It's a good job his language is frozen. Putting the glass of grog to his lips, Reginald, reviving. Thank you. Take my hat off, please. I bought it from a cabman. Gwendolyn removes his hat, which is very shabby. Good morning. Where's my wife Dinah? She's quite safe. I must see her. Speak to her. You can't. She's locked up. Then uh, I must push a long letter under her door. She must, she shall, know that I am going to walk up and down outside this house all my life. Bring writing materials. I'll hunt for the pen and ink. So will I. Reginald, to Peggy. No, no, you do it. These men are bachelors. They can't fear for me. Here's a writing table. Peggy runs to Mallory and opens the lid of the writing table. Note paper and envelopes. Where's the... Opening one of the small drawers, she starts back with a cry. Oh! They all turn and look at her. What's, What's the, the matter? matter? Peggy, taking from the drawer a large bunch of keys, each with a small label, which she examines breathlessly. Duplicate keys of all the rooms in the house? What gross carelessness to leave keys in an open drawer? Girls, why should not we impress this fact upon Admiral Rankling by releasing Dinah immediately? Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. Reginald, seizing Peggy's hand. Oh, Miss Hesseridge, my father-in-law is entertaining an angel on a wares. Oh, stop, stop, stop. I don't think we're quite justified. Ha! Huh. I told you he was merely a bachelor. Pointing to Saunders. So is his companion. Give me the keys. No, no, I take responsibility of this. I am a girl. Going towards the door and looking at Mallory and Saunders as they make way for her. I hope you will repent your line of conduct, gentlemen. She goes out. I think we all shall. There is a sudden noise, as of someone falling down a couple of stairs. They start and listen. Oh! oh. What's that? Ermatrude, looking out at door. Here's Admiral Rankling. There is a suppressed exclamation with a silent scamper to the further end of the room. What the deuce does a respectable man want out of bed at this unearthly hour? Rankling, in a rage, outside the door. Confound that! Oh! oh. Reginald, opening the door leading to the dark room. Here's the room here. Shall we condescend to hide? Yes. 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 
they disappear hastily as Rankling appears in a dressing gown, his face pale and his eyes red and wild. Hello? Someone's been sitting up. Candles and a fire. Ah. Sniffing and walking about the room, he goes straight to the mantelpiece upon which Reginald's grog has been left and takes up the tumbler. It's Mallory. With suppressed passion, it's against the rules for anyone to sit up in my house. But I don't mind, Mallory. I don't. Looking at Sofa. Hello? Mallory's been turning in here. Going to the sofa and sitting there shaking with anger. Are we never to have any more daylight? How long am I to wait till that miserable schoolmistress releases the worm quack it? Quack it! Uncle Fair! The reptile who has made a fool of me in the eyes of my wife and daughter. Ah, but I must husband my strength for Quicket. I have been a very careful man all my life. As far as muscular economy goes, Quicket shall have the savings of a lifetime. Lying down and pulling the rug over him. Uncle Fear! Ah, I was a wild, impetuous, daring lad once. Going to sleep. And I can be unpleasant, even now. I can. The Admiralty doesn't know it. Emma doesn't know it. Quicket shall know it. He breathes heavily. The others have been peeping from their hiding place, and as they close the door, Peggy enters alone, quickly but silently. She looks for the others, then almost falls over Rankling on the sofa, at which she retreats with a suppressed screech of horror. Mallory opens the further door and gesticulates to her violently to be silent. Peggy, petrified. Oh, my goodness gracious. Mallory comes and bends over Rankling, listening to his breathing. He then goes to Peggy. He's dropped off. Where is Mrs. Pallover? She's not on that side of the house. I have a plan for disposing of the old gentleman. Try the other side. I'm going to. Turning and clutching Mallory. But, oh, Mr. Mallory, what do you think I've done? That's impossible to conjecture. I've made a mistake about the doors, and I have unlocked Mr. Quackett. She goes out quickly. Mallory thinks for a moment, then bursts into a fit of silent laughter. <laughs> I love that girl. Reginald appears at the further door, gesticulating. Where is my wife? I can't live longer without her. Where is Dinah? Hush. She'll be here in a minute. Come out of there and lend me a hand. Saunders, Gwendolyn, and Ermatrude enter on tiptoe. To Reginald. Now then, gently... Mallory and Reginald each take an end of the sofa and carry Rankling out through the door into the dark room. If they bump him, all's lost. Mallory and Reginald reappear. I feel warmer now. Turn the key. Reginald turns the key as Dinah and Peggy enter cautiously. Dinah! Dinah! Reggie! My wife! Reginald rushes down to Dinah and embraces her frantically. There is a general cry of relief as Mallory embraces Peggy and Gwendolyn throws her arms around Saunders. Suddenly, there is the sound of someone stumbling downstairs, accompanied by a smothered exclamation. All, listening, What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? that? Ermatrude, peeping out at the door, Here's Uncle Vera got loose. He's fallen downstairs. Oh, bother. Come along, Dinah. Reginald and Dinah, Saunders, Ermatrude, and Gwendolyn go out quickly. Peggy to Mallory, Rather bad taste of your nephew and those girls to run after a newly married couple, isn't it? Yes, we won't do it. No, but we don't want to be bothered with your old friend Quacket, do we? No, he's an awful bore. Is the conservatory heated? Peggy, taking his arm... I don't mind if it isn't. They disappear into the conservatory. The door opens, and Quecket, his face pale and haggard, enters, 
still wearing his hat and the short covert coat over his evening dress, and carrying his gloves and umbrella. To whom am I indebted for being let out? Was it by way of treachery, I wonder? Somebody has been sitting up late or rising early. Who is it? Sniffing and looking about him, then going straight to the mantelpiece, taking up the tumbler and smelling the contents. I'm anxious not to do anyone an injustice. But that's Peggy. Oh, what a night I've passed. I have no hesitation in saying that the extremely bad behavior of Caroline, of the lady I have married, and the ungovernable rage of Rankling, are indelibly impressed upon me. Looking round nervously. Good gracious! I'm actually in the room where Rankling announced his intention of ultimately dislocating my vertebrae. I shall certainly not winter in England. The clock strikes seven. He looks at his watch. Seven. It will be wise to remain here till the first gleam of daylight, and then leave the house unostentatiously. I will exchange no explanations with Caroline. I shall simply lay the whole circumstance of my injudicious boyish marriage before my brother Bob and the other members of my family. Any allowance which Caroline may make me shall come through them. There is a sound of something falling and breaking outside the room. The deuce! What's that? Going on tiptoe over to the door and peeping out. Somebody has knocked something over. Snatching up his hat, gloves, and umbrella. I shan't wait till daybreak if they're breaking other things. He hurries to the other door, opens it, looks out, and closes it quickly. People sitting on the stairs. Is this a plot to surround me? The conservatory? He goes quickly to the conservatory doors, opens them, and then draws back, closing them quickly. Two persons under a palm tree. There is a knock at the door on the right. Oh! Seeing the door leading to the dark room. Where does that lead to? He tries the door, unlocks it, and looks in. A dark room. Oh, I'm so thankful. He disappears, closing the door after him. The knocking outside is repeated. Then the door opens, and Miss Diot enters. She is dressed in her burlesque queen costume. Her face is pale. She carries the head, broken off at the neck, of a terracotta bust of a woman. I have broken a bust now. It is an embarrassing thing to break a bust in the house of comparative strangers. Oh, will it never be daylight? Does the milkman never come to Portland Place? I have been listening at the keyhole of Veer's room. Not a sound. He can sleep with the ruin of Volumnia College upon his conscience while I... Sinking into a chair. Ah, I realize now the correctness of the poet's observation. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Quackett comes quietly from the dark room, much terrified. Rankling's in there, asleep. In the dark I sat on him. Oh, what a narrow escape I've had. Coming behind Miss Diot and suddenly seeing her. Caroline! Scylla and Charybdis. He bolts back into the dark room. Miss Diot, rising, alarmed. <gasps> What's that? Mrs. Rankling enters in a peignoir. I heard something fall. Seeing Miss Diot. Mrs. Quicket. Distantly. Instructions were given that everybody should be called at eight. I had arranged that a more appropriate costume should be placed at your disposal. Seeing the broken bust. Ah, what has happened? I knocked over a pedestal. Mrs. Rankling, distressed. Oh, bust of myself by belt. I saw him working on it. Oh, Mrs. Quicket, is there no end of the trouble you have brought upon us? The trouble you have brought upon me? What? Why didn't you tell us you had a husband? Why didn't you tell me that Dinah had a husband? We didn't know it. Well, if you didn't know your own daughter was married, how can you wonder at your ignorance of other people's domestic complications? But that's not all. 
you have informed us that you are now actually contributing to a nightly entertainment of a volatile description that you are positively being laughed at in public isn't it better to be laughed at in public and paid for it than to be sniggered at privately for nothing mrs quackett you are revealing your true character it is the same as your own an undervalued wife let me open your eyes as mine are opened we have engaged to love and to honour two men i have done nothing of the kind i mean one each oh excuse me now looking at him microscopically is there much to love and to honour in admiral rankling um he is a genial after-dinner speaker <laughs> it is true he is rather austere an austere sailor all bows abroad and stern at home well then knowing what occurred last night is there anything to love and to honour in mr quackett nothing whatever miss diot annoyed and yet he is undoubtedly the superior of admiral rankling very well then do as i mean to do put your foot down if heaven has gifted you with a large one so much the better the voices of quackett and rankling are heard suddenly raised in the adjoining room quackett my dear rankling veer the admiral has released your husband i'll trouble you sir certainly rankling come away and i will advise you bring your head with you miss diot and mrs rankling carrying the broken bust hurry out as quackett enters quickly followed by rankling admiral rankling i shall mark my opinion of your behaviour through the post sit down thank you i've been sitting i sat on you on the sofa sit down quackett sits promptly was an old friend of your family mr quackett i am going to have a quiet chat with you on family matters rankling wheels the armchair near quackett quackett to himself i don't like his calmness i don't like his calmness rankling sits bending forward and glaring at quackett how is your sister janet quite well eh tell me without a moment's delay sir how is janet permit me to say admiral rankling that whatever you're standing with other members of my family you have no acquaintance with the lady you mention oh haven't i drawing his chair near a quacket very well then is griffin quite well Finch Griffin of the Berkshire Royals? I do not know how Major Griffin is, and I feel I do not care. Oh, you don't. Very well, then. Drawing his chair still nearer, Quackett. Will you answer me one simple but important question? If it be a question a gentleman may answer, certainly how often do you hear from your brother tankerville oh rankling clutching quackett's knee he's deputy inspector of prisons in british guiana you know doesn't have time to write often does he admiral rankling you will permit me to remind you that in families of long standing and complicated interests there are regrettable estrangements which should be lightly dealt with affected you have recalled memories rising excuse me rankling rising no sir i will not excuse you where are my gloves because mr quackett i have your assurance as a gentleman that your brother tankerville's daughter is married to a charming young fellow of the name of parkinson 
Now I have discovered that Parkinson is really a charming young fellow of the name of Paul Over. So that as Paul Over has married my daughter, as well as Tankables, Paul Over must be prosecuted for bigamy. And as you know that Paul Over was Parkinson and Parkinson Paul Over, you connived at the crime. Inasmuch as knowing Paul Over was Tankerville's daughter's husband, you deliberately aided Parkinson in making my child Dinah his wife. But that's not the worst of it. Oh? Because I have since received your gentlemanly assurance that Tankerville's daughter is my daughter. Now, either you mean to say that I've behaved like a blackguard to Tankerville, which will be a libel, or that Tankerville has conducted himself with less than common fairness to me, which will be a divorce, and in either case, without wishing to anticipate the law, I shall personally chastise you, because although I've been a sailor on the high seas for five and forty years, I have never, during the whole of that period, listened to such a yarn of mendacious fabrication as you spun me last night. Quacket, beginning to carefully put on his gloves. It would be idle to deny that this affair has now assumed its most unpleasant aspect. Admiral Rankling, the time has come for candour on both sides. Be quick, sir. I am being quick, Rankling. I admit, with all the rapidity of utterance of which I am capable, that my assurances of last night were founded upon an airy basis. In plain words, Lies, Mr. Quackett. A habit of preparing election manifestos for various members of my family may have impaired a fervent admiration for truth, in which I yield to no man. Franklin, advancing in a determined manner. Very well, sir. Quackett, retreating. One moment, Rankling. One moment, if not two. I glean that you are prepared to assault... To chastise. Well, to inconvenience a man at whose table you feasted last night. Do so. I will do so. I say, do so. But the triumph when you kneel upon my body, for I am bound to tell you that I shall lie down, the triumph will be mine. You are welcome to it, sir. Put down that umbrella. What for? I haven't an umbrella. You haven't? Allow me to leave this room, my dear Rankling, and I'll beg your acceptance of this one. Rankling advances fiercely. Quackett retreats. Miss Diot enters. Carolyn! Stop, Admiral Rankling, if you please. Any reprimand, physical or otherwise, will be administered to Mr. Quackett at my hands. I would have preferred rankling. Rankling I could have winded. He goes out quickly, Miss Diot following in pursuit. Veer? I am in my own house, madam. Mrs. Rankling enters, carrying the broken bust. Emma, go to bed. Archibald Rankling, attend to me. Don't roll your eyes, but attend to me. Emma! Your tone is dictatorial. It is meant to be so, because after seventeen years of married life, I am going to speak my mind at last. Holding up the head before him. Archibald, look at that. What's that? Myself, less than ten years ago, the sculpture's earliest effort. Broken. Made of bad stuff. Send it back. It is your memory I wish to send back. Ah, oh, Archibald, do you see how round and plump those cheeks are? People alter. 
You were stout then. I was. In those days I was thin. Frightfully. Very well then. The average remains the same. Some day we may return to the old arrangement. If you ever find yourself a spare man again, Archibald, it won't be because I have worried and fretted you with my peevish ill humour. Emma! As you have worried and worn me with yours. Emma, you have completely lost your head. She raises the broken bust. I don't mean that confounded bust. That was an ideal. And if a mere sculpture could make your wife an ideal, why shouldn't you try? So, understand me finally, Archibald, I will not be ground down any longer. Unless some arrangement is arrived at for the happiness of dear Dina and Mr. Paul Over, I leave you. Leave me? This very day. Wantonly desert your home and husband, Emma? Yes. Covering his face with his handkerchief. And I don't know where to put my hand upon even a necktie. And the world shall learn how highly you thought of Dina's marriage at Mr. Quackett's party last night. Oh. And what a very different man you have always been in your own home. And take care, Archibald, that the verdict of posterity is not that you were less a husband and father than a tyrant and oppressor. Quackett enters, with Miss Diod in pursuit. She follows him out. Veer. Rankling blows his nose and wipes his eyes, and looks at Mrs. Rankling. Emma! Emma! Oh, dear! Oh, dear! Emma! Don't tuck your head under your arm in that way! She puts the broken bust on the table. Emma! There have been grave faults on both sides. Yours I will endeavor to overlook. Ah, now you are your dear old self again. But Emma, you are occasionally an irritating woman to live with. You are the first who has ever said that. So I should hope, Emma. And poor Dina? You will forgive her? On condition that she doesn't see Paul Over's face again for five years. Oh, there will be no difficulty about that. Reginald and Dinah enter. She is dressed for flight. Papa! My father-in-law! They retreat hastily. Who let you out? Who let you in? He goes out after them. Mrs. Rankling follows. Archibald, continue your dear old self. Quackett enters by another door, Miss Diot following him, both out of breath. They look at each other, recovering themselves. I understand that you wish to speak to me, Caroline. Oh, you, you paltry little man. You mean, ungrateful little creature. You laced-up little heap of pompous pauperism. You, you, I cannot adequately describe you. Wretch. Quackett, putting on his gloves again. Have you finished with me, Caroline? Finished with you? I shall never have finished with you. Never, till you leave me. Quackett. Rising. Till I leave you? Till you leave me a widow. Quackett, resuming his seat, disappointed. Oh. You don't think I expect you to leave me anything else. Oh, what could I have seen in you? I take it, Caroline, that in the language of the hunting field, you scented a gentleman. Scented a gentleman? In the few weeks of our marriage, I have scented you, and cigaretted you, wined you, and liquored you, tailored, and hatted, and booted you. I have darned, and mended, and washed you, gruelled you with a cold, tinctured you with a toothache, and linimented you with the gout. 
have i not have i not you certainly have had exceptional privileges familiarity appears to have fulfilled its usual functions and bred the most utter contempt have i not paid your debts not at my suggestion and all for what i assume for love's dear sake carrie for the sake of having the vestal seclusion of alumnia college telegraphically denominated as bachelor diggings any collection of young ladies may be so described the description is happy but harmless as for the subsequent conflagration don't talk about it i say with all sincerity that from the moment the fire broke out till i escaped no one regretted it more than myself that was tyler tyler what tyler i make no historical reference when i say what tyler was it who abruptly tore aside the veil of mystery which had hitherto shrouded the existence of champagne and lobster salad from four young girls it was you no it wasn't carrie upon my word <laughs> upon my honour <laughs> those vexing pupils played the very devil with me after you left the pupils as it were dilated yes and you ordered them champagne glasses i suppose oh deceiver you talk of deception what about the three o'clock train from paddington it was the whole truth there was one but you didn't travel in it what about the clergyman's wife at hereford go there you will find several but you're not staying with them oh carrie how can you meet my fearless glance when you recall that my last words yesterday were cabman drive to paddington the lady will pay your fare i cannot deny that it is by accident you have discovered that i am queen honorine in otto bernstein's successful comic opera and what do you think my family would think of that it is true that the public now know me as miss constance de la porte oh miss constance de la porte the new and startling contralto her first appearance and have i a quacket after all gone and married a connie you have it is true too that last night while you and my pupils were dilating i was singing i and at one important juncture dancing no no not dancing madly desperately hysterically dancing and to think if there was any free list that my brother bob may have been there but do you guess the one thought that prompted me buoyed me up guided my steps and ultimately produced a lower g of exceptional power no the thought that every note i sang might bring a banknote to my lonely veer at home carrie i went through the performance in a dream the conductor's baton beat nothing but veer 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 into my eyes someone applauded me i thought ah that's worth a new hat to veer i sang my political verse a man very properly hissed he has smashed veer's new hat i murmured at last came my important solo i drew a long breath saw a vision of you reading an old copy of the rock by the fireside at home and opened my mouth i remembered nothing more till i found myself wildly dancing to the refrain of my song the audience yelled with approbation i bowed again and again and then tottered away to sink into the arms of the prompter with the words beer catch your carry but my family my brother bob what have they ever done for you while i it was my ambition to devote every penny of my salary to your little wants and isn't it no 
veer albany butte quacket it isn't the moment i dragged you down that ladder last night and left behind me the smouldering ruins of volumnia college i became an altered woman then i will lay the whole affair before my family do and tell them to what your selfishness has brought you that where there was love there is disdain where there was claret there will be beer where there were cigars there will be pipes and where there was pool there will be kino oh why didn't i wait and marry a lady you did marry a lady but scratch the lady and you find a hard-working comic actress be silent madam <laughs> this is my revenge veer quacket to-night i will dance more wildly more demonstratively than ever i forbid it you forbid it you dictate to constance de la porte the hit of the opera i am queen honorine she slaps her hands and sings with great abandonment and in the pronounced manner of the buffo queen the song she is supposed to sing in bernstein's opera reen reen on reen mighty weather wife or queen firm a ruler never seen and reen reen la i will write to my married sisters do and i will call upon them man's a boasting fretting fumer smoking alcohol consumer quick of temper ill of humour oh you shall sing this to my family i will with her hands upon her hips woman has no pet devices cuts her sins in good thick slices with the smile that's sweet and nice is <clears throat> refrain singing and dancing reen reen on the reen mighty weather wife or queen firm a rule and never seen and reen reen la <laughs> she sinks into a chair Ooh, i will tell my brother of you daylight appears through the conservatory doors mrs rankling and dinah enter mallory and peggy enter from conservatory spooning my dear mrs quacket i owe everything to you my treatment of the dear admiral has had wonderful results what do you think the admiral and mr polover are quite reconciled and understand each other perfectly rankling and polover enter glaring at each other and quarrelling violently in undertones look the admiral already regards him as his own child saunders ermertrude and gwendolen enter and join peggy and mallory but we are to be separated for five years oh reggie you trust me implicitly don't you i do and that is why i warn you never to let me hear of you addressing another man oh reggie they embrace don't do that you don't see me behaving in that way to mrs rankling and we've been married for years mrs rankling to dinah but you and mr polover are to be allowed to meet once every quarter yes in the presence of admiral rankling and a policeman mrs rankling rankling dinah and reginald join the others otto bernstein enters quickly and excitedly carrying a quantity of newspapers i beg your pardon i must see miss constance delaport i mean miss diot mr bernstein your house is burned down it does not matter you have made a great hit in my new orator i mean my gomic opera i have been walking up and down fleet street waiting for the babers to come out handing round all the newspapers their dimes their telegraph their daily news their standard their bost their chronicle they are all complimentary except one and that i give to the cabman miss diot reading miss delaporte a decided acquisition go on quacket reading miss delaporte an imposing figure what do they know about it go on go on 
I always say I do not read the papers, but I do. To Miss Diot. You will get fifty pounds a week in my next oratorio. I mean my comic opera. Fifty pounds a week? My carry! I shall be able to snap my fingers at my damn family. How very pleasing. Reading. A voice of great purity, a correct intonation, and a lower G of decided volume rendered attractive some music not remarkable for grace or originality. Bernstein takes the paper from Mrs. Rankling. I did not see that. I will give that to the gabman. Goodbye, I cannot stay. I am going to have a Turkish bath till the evening papers come out. I always say I do not read the evening papers, but I do. He bustles out. Mrs. Quicket, I shall book stalls at once to hear your singing. Oh no, Emma, dress circle. Stalls, Archibald. Rankling, glaring. Dress circle. Stalls, Archibald, or I leave you forever. Very well, Emma. I have no desire but to please you. I take this as a great compliment, my dear Rankling. Carrie and I thank you. But I can't hear of it. I insist on offering you both a seat in my box. Your box? Quacket, softly to her. Hush, Carrie, my darling. Your Veer's private box. Mr. Quacket's private box, during my absence at night, will be our lodgings where he will remain under lock and key. Peggy laughs at Quacket. <laughs> oh, you vexing girl. Excuse me, my dear Quacket, but while looking at the plants in the conservatory, I became engaged to Miss Hesleridge. There is a general exclamation of surprise. Ah, coward, you haven't to wait five years. Jane enters. Oh, if you please, ma'am. Tyler. Tyler? Tyler? Tyler wants to know who's to buy him the reward for being the first official fire engines last night. I will. No, I will. Tyler has rendered me a signal service. He has demolished Volumnia College. From the ashes of that establishment rises the phoenix of my new career. Miss Diot is extinct. Miss Stella Port is alive, and during the evening, kicking. I hope none will regret the change. I shall not for one, while the generous public allow me to remain a favorite. End of Act Three End of The Schoolmistress by Arthur Wing Pinero